Thanks for listening to the Get Over Yourself podcast, brought to you by Carol Fit Stationary Bike Program, 8-Minute Workouts to Get Super Fit, Perfect Keto, the cleanest, highest potency ketone supplements, MOFO, Male Optimization Formula with Organs to Boost Testosterone, Let's Get Checked, At Home Testing Kits, try LGC.com. Almost Heaven, beautiful compact home use sauna kits. Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece, the mind-blowing nut butter blend. And check out bradkerns.com slash shop, my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance. And here we go with the show. You can achieve anything you want with hard work, self-discipline, and a positive attitude. Now, I had heard the hard work formula. Everybody around me worked very, very hard, but I didn't hear about self-discipline, and I didn't hear about the positive attitude. I'm supposed to be a representative of the cosmetic fitness idea that you could have as a bodybuilder, and somehow, after the Mr. Universe, I've gained, I've gone from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow. What the heck's going on? And he said, Wade, I'm going to teach you something that'll change your life. I said, what is it? He says, you've learned to build the body from the outside in. I'm going to teach you how to build the body from the inside out. There's aesthetics, there's performance, and there's health. Most people are attracted into this industry through aesthetics. They want to look better for, you know, there's sexual choices. But ultimately, these three levels, ideally, wouldn't it be great if you could have aesthetics, you could have performance, and you could health. And I believe that is the new area of what we call biological optimization. By optimizing both the length of life and the functional capacity of life. Hey listeners, get ready for a real high energy guest, the very interesting Wade Lightheart. He runs a performance health supplement company called Bio Optimizers. So we're going to get into some topics relating to supplementation, the importance of supplementation, optimizing your digestive function, especially with all the nutrient deficient foods that we consume today. But I'm particularly excited for you to learn about his amazing journey through the world of bodybuilding and how it's helped him get to where he is today. He was very uh, serious about this starting at age 15 when he was out growing up in remote Canada and he worked hard, worked hard, got all the way to the Mr. Universe competition and then his body blew apart after he finished his uh, competition gaining, get this, 42 pounds in 11 weeks. <laughs> and that led him on a health quest because he was like, what the heck happened to my body? I was a picture of uh, aesthetic beauty on the stage. And then he started learning about gut health a long time ago, too. This is years ago before gut health became a hot topic. Uh, so I think you're going to have some really cool takeaway items. He's going to give you the three important things to make sure your digestive function is working optimally. And also the three reasons that we pursue fitness goals. I've never quite heard it characterized this way, but it's for aesthetics, for performance, and for health. And a lot of times we mess up our health in pursuit of the first two, but there is a way to do it right. And Wade proved that by coming back to the bodybuilding world about five years after his major blow up and performing better than he ever had before. Again, with no drugs, just total health optimization. He's a real trendsetter in this area. So coming to you, from the muscle building capital of the world, Venice Beach, California. It's Wade Lightheart. Enjoy. Wade Lightheart, I gotcha. I'm so excited. Your your team members around the world have been communicating wonderfully with me and getting me all excited. I got my shipment of products from Bio Optimizers, so I'm extremely pumped. I can't believe the amazing array of stuff you have there. So we're going to get deep into it on the show. And I, I would like to talk about some of your uh, interesting bodybuilding background. I think it's appropriate since you're sitting there in Venice Beach, California, the world epicenter of bodybuilding. Uh, but how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. And yes, I have arrived as the bodybuilding version of Mecca. Unfortunately, the gym is closed right now. <laughs> uh, it doesn't quite do it when you go to Muscle Beach and walk by the empty racks. Yeah, it's strange, you know, and I, I literally live a stone's throw away from the original Gold's Gym on the same street. So my 15-year-old childhood fantasies of coming to California, living here, training with Arnold Schwarzenegger, I did get to see him quite often originally when Goals was open when I first arrived here a few months ago. 
uh, before the lockdowns. And uh, he's in there every morning, just like he said he was going to and uh, pumping iron. He would never quit. And, you know, he's one of the guys at the gym. Oh, my goodness. So how long ago did you get into this and tell us about your your career and your your journey that's brought you today to to, to the bio optimizers role and uh, all that athletic background, which is so fascinating, especially the sound bite that you gained 42 pounds after a bodybuilding show. I want to know how that's possible. Yeah. Great. Okay. So real simple. Um, I was a kid that grew up in Canada, you know, in a place called New Brunswick, which is very similar to Maine. Uh, they're right beside each other and uh, played hockey and lived an ordinary life until I was 15 years old when a dramatic series of events happened in a very short period of time. And what happened was my parents moved from a little village to a no village. It was five miles to my nearest neighbor up a dirt road. The telephone poles ended at our door. We'd be snowed in for several days. I'd take a snowmobile to get out to the bus sometimes. And uh, although they were the caretakers for a wealthy business person who owned this beautiful resort, uh, which is a great place to visit, but certainly not some place you want to be when I was 15. So I had a, I was taken away from my friends, uh, taken away from my regular sporting activities uh, and separated, you know, in isolation, which gave me a lot of time by myself, a lot of time to reflect and had to figure out something to do. Concordantly, uh, my sister, who was four years my senior, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which is a form of cancer of the lymph nodes. And over the next four years, I watched her go through the medical model before she died at the age of 22. That had a profound impact on me in the fact that I was curious in kind of a naive way as she went through these treatments, we'd come home from a 55 mile drive from her treatment and we'd have to stop maybe five, six times or she'd be vomiting and stuff. And I was like, how is it that the treatment, it seems to be worse than the disease? Very odd. And so that led me to go study exercise physiology university. But then the third thing that happened during this very short window of period of time is my sister gave me a bodybuilding magazine. And that bodybuilding magazine had on the cover Troy Zuclato, who was a blonde guy like myself, who had just won the Mr. California contest and had these two pretty girls in bikinis on the cover. Uh, and looking at his hypermuscularity and their hyper femininity, I was like, well, maybe if I got these muscles, I could get girls like that. Maybe I could be a bodybuilding. And then I, in the pages, I discovered a fellow by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, who just so happened to be the biggest movie star in the world at that time. He had won Mr. Universe and Mr. Olympia and all these things, and had got an acting career and was married to the Kennedys. And I got his book, Education of a Bodybuilder. And inside that book, he had a very similar story. He had an older brother that died at an early age. He um, lived in a very small country called Austria. And he got into this kind of weird of two sports called bodybuilding that everybody thought was crazy, but he transformed that into becoming, you know, very successful, famous and living this amazing life in California. And he said three things inside that book that changed my life. He said, you can achieve anything you want with hard work, self-discipline and a positive attitude. Now I had heard the hard work formula. Everybody around me worked very, very hard, but I didn't hear about self-discipline and I didn't hear about the positive attitude. And so Arnold became my new de facto mentor. I built a gym in my barn. And in that barn, I had sawhorses and makeshift pulley systems where if I didn't, if I pulled the weight too far, it would smack me in the head. I had, you know, two wheelers under tractor tires and uh, a little York barbell set that I had uh, purchased from my summer job that I engaged in. And I would go out there every day and train. And even in the winter, time when I would go out there and sometimes my hands would freeze to the bar because it was 40 below and I was training in a snowmobile suit and my parents and family members and all this stuff thought I was nuts and I would get on my soapbox every week and say you know what one day I'm going to compete in the Mr. Universe and represent my country I'm going to own a supplement company and help people around the world and I'm going to live in Venice Beach California and all of those things came true over time and so Arnold's information was right. Now, it wasn't easy. I had no business to be in bodybuilding. I had terrible genetics. My parents looked like, you know, you, they could pass for Smurfs. Um, but I had a lot of determination and discipline. And although I didn't win the Mr. Olympia, I did compete at the Mr. Universe. Uh, I went through a career at exercise physiology. I mentored under a fellow by the name of Scott Abel, one of the greatest bodybuilding coaches ever to live. And was able to, after 16 years of training from that image, it'll 15 yard 
go to the Mr. Universe, represent my country and got the pictures and all that stuff going. And I did it as a vegetarian and drug free, which is a whole other story. But after that contest, I gained 42 pounds of fat and water in 11 weeks. So everything that I had led to, everything that I learned, the, the, the expertise, the discipline, the Spartan workouts, the, the, the expertise, everything led me to this moment and my body blew up. And I had the good fortune of meeting a guy by the name of Dr. Michael O'Brien, who was a senior citizen. He was in his 70s. He was super vibrant. He was giving a seminar and he was everything that you would want to be as a senior citizen. You could hope it was shocking to see his skin, his eyes, his cognitive capacity, his energy level, his vibrancy, his health. And he had overcome uh, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, advanced stage of uh, colon cancer. He had helped Bernard Jensen, the, the godfather of iridology in America and the digestive health system recover from a serious health challenge that he had in his book, Come Alive, it's all detailed. And he told me something that I said, Dr. O'Brien, you know, you come to him, I'm like, what's going on? I'm supposed to be a representative of the cosmetic fitness idea that you could have as a bodybuilder. And somehow after the Mr. Universe, I've gained, I've gone from Mr. Universe to Mr. Marshmallow. What the heck's going on? And he said, wait, I'm going to teach you something that will change your life. I said, what is it? He says, you've learned to build the body from the outside in. I'm going to teach you how to build the body from the inside out. I went under his tutelage. And I took massive amounts of enzymes and probiotics and minerals and vitamins and changed my dietary practices from what would it say a performance diet to a health diet mm. being the new oh, determinant of the same Wade, Wait a sec. They're not. Oh my gosh. They're, exactly. A uh, key distinction. And within six months, not only did I capture my physical condition, but I hit a new level of vibrancy, cognitive capacity, awareness, my skin, I, like People are like, what are you doing? Like I, I, I went from performance parameters of a low body fat level and a certain level of muscular, muscularity to a low body fat, a, you know, a high level of muscularity, but super health and vibrancy. And I realized at that time there was three different areas and we address these at Bioptimizers. There's aesthetics, there's performance, and there's health. Hmm. Most people are attracted into this industry through aesthetics. They want to look better for the... Uh, you know, there's sexual choices. Uh, that's really the basis, the driver of the fitness industry, the cosmetic industry, the, you know, the, all these different industries, fashion industry. But <laughs> eventually- secret, Wade's, <laughs> Wade's telling us the truth now. It's all based on sexuality and that, uh, that subconscious programming. I love that. And uh, those three are, uh, I want to hear how they uh, blend together. That's really interesting. Well, and if you really get into that, you start having a performance diet, which I did. And now a performance mm. diet for many people in the middle age is like, how do I deal with my kids, my job, get in the <laughs> little league and gymnastics and still function and be happy and maybe get a day off on the weekend that a lot of families are struggling with. They're looking at a performance-based diet. And so in, in, in their performance-based diet might be taking, you know, copious amounts of caffeine. It might be involving using some sort of pharmaceutical enhancement, whether that's hormone therapy or medications or antidepressants or who knows, whatever. Those are performance-based diets because anything that goes into your body, whether it's drugs or food or chemicals, is part of your diet. And also, I would say the information you take in is a big part of your diet. But eventually, what comes to everybody's uh, realization is the bottom part of that triangle, and that is you end up in some sort of health crisis. In other words, your number one value becomes your health. Now, some people get attracted to this because they have compromised health early on and, and, and go that route. Some people because they get into aesthetics. Some people because, you know, they're, they don't care about how they look, but they've got to perform on the field or perform on the job. But ultimately, these three levels, ideally, wouldn't it be great if you could have aesthetics, you could have performance and you could help. And I believe that is the new area of what we call biological optimization by optimizing both the length of life and the functional capacity of life so that you can stay, you can live long, but live strong to your desired or uh, biological predestined age, or maybe even extend that. Who knows? So that's, that's the mission. And Matt, my business partner and I have been on that mission together uh, since 2004, when after I captured these titles and stuff, we 
created a, I wanted to help avoid other people in the bodybuilding industry avoid the mistakes that I made because when I looked at the careers of the pros when I looked at the careers of many of the amateurs that didn't even make it to pro or all these sort of stuff they all end up in some form of health crisis all of them across the wow. board and I was like there's something wrong with this performance that we need to start. And we started the original biohacking stuff. We talked about my machines. We talked about digestive aids. We talked about um, hot, cold showers. We started talking about all accelerating sleep and all these different things, which are now in vogue and have advanced considerably in having these technological innovations. But that was the precursor to Bioptimizers, the company we now run today, which is basically providing these insights and tools for the masses. Woo, wind this guy up and he's off and running. I love these kind of shows, man. I'm, in, I'm enjoying the story. And wow, there's so many uh, uh, questions and, and insights that come forth. And I, I now realize that, well, I guess in general, when we're going for aesthetics or going for performance, we most regularly screw them up. And so they do trash your health. But it seems possible that uh, you can look good uh, perform well and also support your health. And I think that's kind of my mission as an older guy right now. I talk all the time about my career when I was a professional triathlete, I was extremely fit, but I destroyed my health. And now I'm trying to pursue athletic goals, uh, that are aligned with that, that dream to have a, you know, functional lifelong capacity. So boy, if anybody's, uh, been there and, and, you know, learned through experience where now you're coming out with, you know, supplements and programming, it seems like you've pushed it to the very extremes of uh, performance and aesthetics and bodybuilding and then uh, learn the various mistakes that happen along the way. Yeah, I call it, um, we have a, a, an idea behind our company and our company is for focusing on biological optimization for humans, which is where all of the components that make it work, uh, the symphony of factors that make it work flowing in whole is both the quantity and quality of these products. But we have what I call the Formula One philosophy. And the Formula One philosophy is everybody today, you know, has a car or drives a car or uses transportation. Now in Formula One racing, you have these, you know, highly advanced people who take extraordinary amount of risks driving cars at, you know, 180, 200 miles an hour around crazy tracks under extreme conditions. And they crash. They go off the road. They blow the cars up. They catch on fire. You know, they blow in. Like they spend an extraordinary time, effort, energy, money, and extreme peril. And in those extreme conditions, technology is developed to make those cars, like disc brakes and power steering and aerodynamics and all of the and technical innovations and electrical, all these sort of things get advanced. And that technology trickles down into your car experience so that you drive down the road and a safer place than you could otherwise. And that is a pretty fascinating thing. And so we've applied those same principles that you can discover only on the edges. Basically, you are accelerating your uh, performance span. You're, you're actually taking away from your health. You're sacrificing health for performance. You're taking a certain amount of calculated risk as all athletes do. And I want to be clear about this. Athletes are fit, not necessarily healthy. And we have built a model that sacrifices the health in pursuit of this performance. But the Formula One philosophy says, okay, we, we're not making condemnation of that. What we're going to say is, how do we extend the performance career of those people? What are the things that we can learn on those edges? And then we can apply to Ma and Pa America so that they can live their highest performance in their life and avoid some of the pitfalls that are invariably going to happen as we age and degenerate. And not only that, we can apply these technologies and start returning the body back to a higher level of health and a higher level of performance. And concordantly, oftentimes that has some aesthetic appeal and people are like, wow, and we're seeing this now in professional sports, if you take a guy like LeBron James, uh, Tom Brady, um, mm. these type of individuals who are spending an extraordinary amount of money in probably upwards of a million dollars a year to maintain a peak level of performance that is extended past the normal age capacity. 
And so they're basically putting out their performance lifespan. They're extending that. Now, the, for them, that's making them millions and millions of dollars. Like one year to do that is, okay, I spend a million and I make 30. Well, hey, that's a great investment, right? I, you know. So the bottom line is, is that philosophy will make technology more affordable, more effective, easier to access as it trickles down. And we're on that kind of bleeding edge when it comes to uh, internalized digestive optimization. And now we're moving into nervous system regulation and things like that. I love it. So you take the, I mean, you're taking the, um, the, the best innovations, as well as the crash and burn of the, the tires or the brakes that uh, didn't quite hold through under pressure. So you're taking the best and the worst of the, the people out on the edge and then uh, applying it to uh, mainstream. So when you were in your bodybuilding uh, scene there and your body, you, you describe it as falling apart after the show, what do you think was going on? Was it a, sort of a rebound from an extreme training regimen or uh, not enough food while you were doing the extreme training regimen because you're trying to cut up or what, what happened yes. to blow up 42 pounds in, in, in 11 weeks? Yeah, great question. And you know, I've unpacked this over the decades to kind of work it all out. And as far as we can tell, there was the, uh, several different factors. Number one, I was on ex extreme calorie restriction over the period of two years, uh, preparing to qualifications. And then that year, normally you diet for 12 to 20 weeks to prepare for a show. 20 weeks is kind of the extreme side. 12 is most common. 16 is probably at the high performance level. And I was going to the 20-week level because physically I didn't have the gifts of my competitors but I could out condition them. So I would win by just crazy low levels of body fat. Now, the problem with that was in the year that I qualified, I had to have low body fat levels. I think my first contest was in June of that year. Five weeks later was the national championships, but the world championships wasn't until November, which meant I had to stay in that, you know, single digit body fat percentage, which, and it's not a healthy place. You're going into like health compromising uh, levels of body fat for an extended period of time, almost six months that I stayed at that level, which is very difficult, very hard and not very healthy. So that was one factor. The second factor is, is I was applying what I call a meat eating mentality to my plant-based diet. I was using casein or not casein, but uh, whey-based protein, not like the kind of high quality stuff you can get today. That was a long time ago and they didn't have availability that we have today. And so I was taking all this whey protein, which was leading to undigested proteins inside my body, inside my mm. body, which was feeding bad bacteria. These bad bacteria were producing uh, toxins inside that was affecting my brain health, impairing neurotransmitter formation, making my joints ache by the depositing of uric acid crystals and things like that inside the body, which is quite common with people with high protein diets. So, so my digestion was compromised. So as soon as I got off that competition, number one, I wanted to eat a lot. Number <laughs> two, my gut biome was a disaster. Number three, I had gads of undigested protein, both in my intestine tract, floating through my blood system, probably coagulating inside my cells. And by then engaging after I got my kind of brain came back online somewhat, but I had edema, I was obviously now overweight. Uh, and all these things, when I see Dr. Brian, I was like, I was able to kind of detoxify my body and optimize my digestive system and then move from 250 grams of protein a day to 85. Now, the part I didn't tell you about that story is we started coaching people from around the world on this in our bodybuilding thing. We ended up with a community of 15,000 people that Matt and I coached from every age, category, genetic background, walks of life, dietary practice, all that stuff. We gathered all of that data and started testing our enzyme formulation. We started testing our probiotic. We started testing minerals and vitamins. We started doing this and figuring out things that worked in clinical effectiveness, not a double blind study that here we're controlling all the parameters. We're talking about real world uh, functionality. After four years, I went back in just a few weeks, got ready for the national championships, won both my classes. Three months later, went to the world championships, um, placed fifth in the world where I placed 13th the time before, 
had no rebound after the competition, had no downtime of my brain function, body fat, all that stuff. And I was actually, I had more muscle than I had the previous uh, competition four years older, eating only 85 grams of protein a day because I'd optimized my digestion. I'd optimized my ability to transport amino acids. I had improved my recovery parameters inside the body. And I was following something that uh, was rather radical, but certainly allowed me to perform at a higher level than before while maintaining my health and achieving the aesthetic ideal. At that point, I took that message now from the bodybuilding community and start applying it into the mainstream community and created what I call the awesome health formula, which is a seven pillar approach to uh, what it takes to really make your body function at its highest performance. And that's the foundation of our company's philosophy. So you're saying that it's possible to be a healthy, high-performing bodybuilder, which is widely regarded as impossible, but you came back four or five years later and everything was dialed in and you even performed better. Yes, and here's the thing, right? And this is um, a cognitive bias that I think is pervasive in the athletic community. And that is the advent in use of particularly performance enhancing drugs has had a long history of at least 60 to 70 years. And oh, wait a second. That's taking us back to, um, let's see, the the 60s, right? The the Eastern Bloc was starting to unroll those things. And of course, we saw in the 72 Olympics with the... um, the deep voice women breaking world records in, in swimming and in track. And uh, in, in the case of track, some of those records still hold and may never be broken by, by today's females. So you're right, man, that's a long time. Right. So performance enhancing technology, let's call it that as opposed to just drugs, because there's other things that people do. And we're most familiar with say steroids and things like that, but there is, you know, there is just an, a laundry list. And of course, if you look at drug testing today in performance sports, it, in, it keeps increasing. And so there's this game between the insider chemist creating products that may show up or may be non-detectable on the test, and then the testing people who are trying to catch all the things that they're doing. So it's this cat and mouse game that's going on behind the scenes of virtually all sports, okay? I, I know people are talking about the Olympics because at the end of the day, gold medalists make a lot of money. And I think Lance Armstrong missed an incredible opportunity when he was busted for drugs. And he should have just came out and said, look, everybody at that level is on these drugs. We've done it because if you want to win at that level, you just go this route. And because it's all hidden behind the scenes, we're not getting the full effect of information. The other thing is, is we have a seven years head start on the drug usage program. And we've only been into the alternative of technology for maybe 15 years, 20 at the most. So the natural health industry and the biohacking industry, which is now starting to grow up and, and, and influencing, and as testing gets better, the availability and, and health compromising drugs that are being used for performance are getting less and less prevalent. And there's an influx of these biohacking technologies. So at some point, I believe we will get a state where we will actually be able to produce higher levels of performance in a healthy way, because it only stands the reason if you and I are sitting here, if you take two athletes, right? I, let's say they're twins with identical genetics and the identical psychology and sport, and they're competing together. And one is using all of the health optimization technology available today, let alone what's in the future. And one is not. Who do you think is going to perform better at the end? Yeah, the the optimizer, obviously. Uh, And yeah, and who's going to have the longer career? That too. Yeah, I I just wonder sometimes if the doped up athlete, which as you just accurately stated, still exists today in in many, many sports, including the Tour de France packs. You can conclude that without a doubt. Um, I wonder if they're simply uh, successfully masking some of the shortcomings in their lifestyle and their diet and their sleep habits and their performance habits where 
this, the ultra clean athlete taking advantage of everything like LeBron James, let's say, and, and spending a million dollars a year reportedly on his health care. Uh, maybe those two guys would match up evenly, but that shortcut is so compelling. And of course, you know, from bodybuilding, um, and I, I've talked to old time, uh, you know, serious strength training athletes who report that, you know, after three or four years of hard work in the gym, they can get cut up to a certain extent and then see someone come in in six weeks with the needles, get to their level that they worked hard for several years. Uh, but yeah, we haven't talked about longevity, but of course those drugs are going to be, you know, highly suspect how, how things are going to end up when they're trying to extend their career into their forties, like Tom Brady. Well, you know, it's interesting, and I'll, I'll share a personal story. You know, in, in 1998, when I first went to my first national championships, there was no drug testing in then, and I experimented with performance-enhancing drugs. And let me tell you, they work, they're effective, and they, they, like you said, they accelerate your results. At the end of that contest, I realized that um, that was, an, that was a, a realm that I didn't want to go down any further because I saw guys like Ronnie Coleman at the time. Dorian Yates came in, Ronnie Coleman. And I... I, I one of my successful aspects was my ability to assess where I was and what my real capacity was. And oh, I love the sport and I love the process of the sport. I recognized no amount of drugs was going to allow me to defeat Ronnie Coleman for any reason. Uh, bodybuilding champions are the most elite champion of any sport there is. There's only been about 15 Mr. Olympias in the history since 1965. Oh, because these guys win so many times when they get on because, top? Because, it, because the, the combination of genetics, capacity to handle drugs, and the years of training it takes to perform at that level, you know, it's a, only one in millions and millions of people can be that guy. Right. Or that right. girl. It's, it's a very rare combination. And that's not to say there's a lot of benefits to strength training and body but there is there it's a tremendous sport it's an amazing sport and one of the best sports and one of the sports that you can do literally for the rest of your life the you can't stay on drugs for the rest of your life or, <laughs> or even an extended period of time and so i left this I, I left and retired from the sport at that point now when drug tested competitions came in i said hey i'm going to do those now i knew that some people were breaking the the barriers but i thought it's still a more level playing field that allowed me drug to get free. They, they started to have drug free competition. Yes. And so that meant extensive testing and trying their hardest to get people that were uh, yes. natural bodybuilding or whatever the term. Yes. Now okay. I was able to get to the Mr. Universe contest. Now going into the Mr. Universe contest, I had a, and this is, I don't know if I've even ever told this. So your listeners are going to get this. All right, people. I had, a, I had a conversation with my coach and he said, look, um, you're going to be competing against guys who were on drugs do you want to take the avenue of masking what you're going to do to give yourself an even playing field? Because based on where you're tracking, you've got a shot at winning if you're willing to bend the rules. And that was an existential crisis. And I said, no, I am going to go without doing this. Full knowing that I would not be able to win mm -hmm. the Mr. Universe because I was at such a disadvantage. Now, the ironic part is when you choose the right path, miracles happen. When I went there to the competition, it turns out I was picked up at the airport at two o'clock in the morning by a, a crew of, uh, from an Indian newspaper. And they were fascinated because I was into meditation. I was into a plant-based diet, which was very concordant with the Indian philosophy. I ended up getting a full page a review in the, in the Hindustan Times, which is one of the number one papers over there, be the equivalent of the New York Times here. And uh, I got all this publicity when I came back. Matt said, it's so rare that a guy that's not on drugs and is a plant-based guy, I think we can make a company out of this. He was an online marketer. I thought he was crazy. I didn't even own a computer. And we started the company, which is the foundation of, of, of Bioptimizers today was that foundation. So by making the right choices, even though I didn't get the glory, didn't get the win, didn't get all that sort of stuff, it set me on a, a pathway that led to the development of Bioptimize today. And my life is absolutely fantastic. And I've been able to impact literally thousands and thousands and thousands and the thousands of people help recover their health and vitality and, and perform at a high level because of that decision that I had no idea what the consequences was. So I, I guess it's important to share that message. That's beautiful. I love that. And 
um, I don't think anyone but a, an athlete facing the same thing can fully appreciate that existential crisis, as you called it. And I really appreciate some of the cyclists uh, speaking out now, Floyd Landis, Tyler Hamilton with their books, and of course, Lance on his recent documentary. But when you're in the midst of a you know highly engrossing a competitive challenge and drugs are part of the game, uh, you know, it's easy to uh, rationalize and join up with the pack to try to stay with the pack instead of get dropped. And I think we most of the, mostly the public's looking at Lance as such a nasty, dirty cheater. But, you know, at the same time, uh, he's racing down the hill and his main competitor, Ulrich, goes off the side of the road and he commands the entire pack to slow down so that the guy could get back on his bike resume the race, catch back up, and then have a fair race to the top of the mountain. So it's one of the most honorable and sportsmanlike sports you'll ever see uh, in the Tour de France. And I think we need to have that big picture perspective that, you know, the the powers that be that are controlling these sports and in the NFL, the drug testing is still extremely lax compared to an Olympic sport. And so the athletes are pretty much compelled to either, you know, get drafted or watch on TV on Sunday. And so it's still a really tough situation in society. Uh, but that's a great kind of um, uh, anecdote that you share, because otherwise you're coming home with a story that you got 31st and you could have got 12th and uh, no one cares. And, you know, it's, it's lost in the shuffle. So, yeah, way, way to go, man. To, you know, taking your own you, you're you're trying your best to do the best you could with your journey and your parameters and your definition of that. And that's what success is all about for all of us, really. Yeah. And I think for other people to recognize is that uh, I don't think people understand the type of pressure or the type of psychology it takes to be a world-class athlete, just to even get to a world-class you have to get to a Tour de France, a Mr. Universe, or, or to play at the NCAA level. It is a life path that requires Massive sacrifice, massive commitment, and extraordinary levels of perseverance, self-discipline, some genetic, some some ability. Mm -hmm. You do have to have some ability, but the work that's put into them, the dedication that these athletes go forward. And at the end of the day, that competitive spirit gets pressures them. And Lawrence Taylor talked about this a long time ago where he says, yeah, you know, you're sitting there and you're you're, you're playing on your sport and you play the same position and you're kind of sharing your time with your buddy that's doing the same thing. He goes on a cycle. He's bench pressing 30 pounds more. He's carrying 10 pounds more muscle. He's uh, one tenth of a point, you know, faster than you are in the 40 in this. And then all of a sudden uh, the next year, he's a little bit more and he gets more playing time. And then he gets picked up in draft. You're in your senior year. And there's now a new freshman that's coming in at your position. And he's doing the same thing that your other guy, you got one, two years left that's your shot or you don't make it. What do you do? Whew. And I think if people would just walk over to their pharmaceutical cabinet, open the door and take a hard look at that and say, Hey, what drugs am I using today to perform in my job or in my lifestyle? And why am I so condemning of those people? So if we have these open conversations and we share this inside information to the general public and we turn it back to them to recognize that they're on performance enhancing drugs. And I'm not advocating performance enhancing drugs. I'm not using any drugs. I don't, I don't use any hormones. I don't use any drugs. I don't use any of these things. But I made that choice way back in 1998. And it took me, it's 22 years later, now, have I got a system that can perform at the levels of drugs as far as peak performance? No, I don't. Do I have something that can extend your healthy performance for a longer period of time? Absolutely. And that's why we're here today. All right. Well, that's nice, uh, interesting tangent we got off with the performance enhancing drugs. I have a lot of strong feelings about that because my professional career uh, kind of ended right before the advent of EPO, which threw all the endurance sports on its ear. And right. boy, you know, when you can get an instant 6% advantage with the same training, um, 
you know, then we're going off into the, into the dark age of, of sport, which we're still in, especially with the endurance sports. But back to uh, an interesting comment you made about unpacking all the stuff that had happened to you uh, when your body blew up in, in your first foray in, into bodybuilding. And one of the things you mentioned was that discovery of uh, your gut dysfunction. And that was years before the you know, emergence now only in the last few years of the gut microbiome as being a centerpiece of healthy living. So I'm wondering how you kind of figured that out so long ago. I mean, the excess protein, we've known for a long time how, how bad that is for the body. So you had that one tagged. But then the other part with your digestion, which also seems to be uh, the main thrust of your company, I'd love to get into that topic. Great question. So Dr. O'Brien, the man I met was the complete, clearly responsible. Now he was saying some things that were counterproductive to what are counterintuitive to what I was advocated in the performance world. And he cited a fellow by the name of Dr. Edward Howell, who was the godfather of enzymes. And Dr. Howell's book was resurrected by a fellow by, by the name of Victorus Kalvinskas. And Victorus Kalvinskas was a, uh, disciple, if you will, of Paul Bragg, the guy that put the first health food store in America. And he was digging around in medical school at the Harvard Medical Lab and found these books written by Dr. Edward Howell from the 30s and 40s that had um, talked about the change of what was happening in food production distribution. And he started replicating the famous Pottinger's cat studies and Pottinger's cats was they were feeding cats an enzymatically deficient diet. And by the third generation, these cats lost the ability to procreate, had weird sociological behaviors and had genetic uh, rapid rise in genetic based illness. Well, he replicated these studies over all these different species. Now, keep in mind, by the time World War II hit, we switched to from conventional crop rotation to government induced uh, monoculture farming, throwing nitrogen on the soil, our food production and distribution to meet a growing, uh, you know, expansion of human population, uh, right? That's why they came up with these ideas to, for factor food. We changed production, we changed distribution, we started adding herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides, which all interrupt enzymatic activity. Dr. Howell predicted by the time three generations went by that we would lose the ability to procreate. We'd have the advent of genetic based disease, diseases and we'd have alternative uh, obtuse actions within human behavior. Well, guess what? We're three generations away from what Dr. Howell predicted, which he replicated through all these species, taking out enzymes and the probiotics, which were naturally present in the food that we were getting. And guess what? Here we are today with that. And so Dr. Howe actually, actually taught Dr. O'Brien these principles. And, and when Dr. O'Brien ran into his health conditions, he remembered what Howe said. What, oh, well, so then they, they interacted. And the long story short is he cultivated this to recover from a serious condition by changing his digestive health and re resulting in that and started teaching that who mentored me who then went to Dr. Howe's books and then interacted with Kavinska's and all this sort of stuff. And that's where we got to today by creating uh, formulations that optimize the gut. Because right now in America, 12% of the emergency hospital visits are related to gastrointestinal illnesses. A hundred million Americans on any given day are suffering from some sort of digestive distress that is using either an over-the-counter or prescription medication for digestive related illnesses because everything that we're doing to our food, the drugs, the chemicals, the disruption in the microbiome, the genetic modification, the chemicals that are doing have disrupted this single canal from your mouth to your bum. And there's five key elements that goes to this digestion. It's a very elaborate process. And it's not what you eat, it's what you digest, absorb, and utilize. And if you have a compromised digestion, not only are you gonna have digestive distress now, but you're going to be one of those statistics ending up into an emergency hospital visit where you need, you know, something cut out of you or some sort of horrible condition that ensues uh, onward, or you'll be dependent on prescription medications for the rest of your life. So I'm, I'm guessing the digestive distress is coming from eating the nasty processed food that is the, the uh, centerpiece of the standard American diet. And what's the, what's the path to, 
to healing, you have the enzymes and probiotics that you promote. So I imagine we're going to be recommending to get on a, a good supplement program, but also going hand in hand with healthy dietary choices. I'm also curious if you're still plant-based, like you report back in your bodybuilding days. Yeah, I'm still plant-based. My business partner's a keto guy. So we're at opposite ends of the spectrum. We're dietary agnostic. We believe that you should select a diet based on your lifestyle, uh, your genetic, uh, Back to background, uh, your detoxification pathways, and what you enjoy. So we're dietary agnostic. That's the, but what's great is we go back and forth to find common elements. And I would say this: the USDA allows fifty different chemicals on organic produce. Uh, regular produce has no regulation, and in many places we do not get to know about genetic modification of our food. So you know, I'm from Canada, and the government has uh, basically out banned people from knowing which products are genetically modified and which is not, and it's pervasive in many places in the states as well. Combined with that, these herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides may be also sprayed onto the food in transport. Plus, food is irradiated, so you could be choosing what you feel is a healthy diet organic, which is filled with chemicals, which are what are we call digestive disruptors inside the body over and above the, the, the processed foods and the Franken foods and the foods with preservatives and dyes and all these other things. So basically there is a massive amount of elements which are disrupting the digestive health of everybody, no matter how well you're trying to choose that diet. And in order to get the most out of that diet, you need to remove as much chemicals as possible, but use the advents to make sure that you're getting enough enzymes and probiotics, uh, make sure your hydrochloric levels are optimal in order that you can accelerate this, not only the digestive process, but be the front lines of your immune system, because the front line of your immune system is also the digestive system. So if I'm pumped up, I want to be healthy, I know I'm doing the best I can with my dietary choices, going to the right stores, uh, but still uh, some things are sneaking in there that are, that are causing problems. And I walk over to the, uh, the refrigerated probiotic section and grab uh, whatever one I, I, I put my hand on. Um, is this always going to lead to a benefit or is there some selectivity necessary? I've heard comments that you should strive for variation. So you should take a few different brands of probiotic to get different strains. How do you, how do you uh, feel about that? Yeah, well, we're entering into what I say is the beginning of the golden age of probiotic research. I mean, I've been in the probiotic conversation for 15 years and we have uh, a couple of PhDs in microbiome uh, biofilm, particularly about looking at the strains. And there's anywhere from two to 500 strains inside the average person's digestive tract. And these strains are critical to uh, every aspect of digestive health. Now, the thing is, when you go to the store and buy something that's requiring refrigeration, you see that probiotics require very specific environments in order for to survive. Now, I've worked in every area of the nutrition industry from manufacturing to owning my own store to owning my own company and developing products. The, uh, the chances that your product has been able to maintain that temperature from the time it was produced mm -hmm. to the time it gets shipped to a storage facility, that storage facility goes to maybe a distributor, that distributor goes to a store, and then that store shelves it, and then that's going to maintain that same temperature during that time is almost zero. Now, a one degree difference in temperature in a probiotic strain is going to cause a doubling of the activity of that probiotic. And in order for that to survive, it's going to need what's called prebiotics. Prebiotics are the food that these living organisms eat. And we have a symbiotic relationship between these probiotics. If we don't have these probiotics, we're dead. We die. We don't have an immune system. We don't are able to digest our food. They're that essential. The chances of that food that you got in a cold refrigerated self that is that if it's not been freeze dried are almost zero that you have any active because those bacteria are going to eat up that probiotics when waiting then they're going to starve to death same thing when they go inside the body when they go inside the body if they don't have the prebiotics with that food or you're not eating a diet that supports that bacteria you have to realize that those bacteria are probably going to die within 24 hours and there's viome tests and stuff that you can take that there's evidence of that. So that's why your probiotics, you want to choose something that works with your diet, something that has that your, and your diet has enough prebiotics and that those strains are conducive to your particular genetics and epigenetics. And so you can do testing for this. Like for example, the biome test, you can do a gut map, all these different ones that are emerging where you can find out what's present, what's not what diet's right for you and what's going to work best. And then making, adding those things in as well, taking those away. So long story short, I do believe 
freeze-dried probiotics with the uh, elements inside of it, that with the prebiotics. So when they get into the gut and become active in that warm, hot environment, because that's going to go up many degrees and the environment's perfect for them to grow, they have the food that they can, they can take hold and continue forward. And so we, de- we develop different strains for different reasons and different activities inside the body. Uh, some are transient, some are colonizers. And by selecting these, um, you can determine which one is right for you, or you can rotate over periods of time. Oh, interesting, man. I've always gone into the store thinking that if it's refrigerated, it's got to be more legit than something just sitting on the shelf because obviously cold is preserving something and, uh, you know, it's more of a special product. You need to get it in your fridge when you get home. So you're kind of throwing that uh, into into the myth category. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense that the freeze dried is preserving it through thick and thin on the arduous journey to the, the store shelf. So uh, that's a good That's a good checkpoint there. And then I'm also wondering, uh, you gave that example of you and your partner with uh, disparate dietary patterns. How important do you think the genetic particulars are or the personal personal attributes of all kinds uh, when it comes to choosing the best diet? I mean, I, I imagine you're convinced that your way of eating is the best for you, but then you're also standing as an agnostic, which is so rare these days. <laughs> hey, Wade's not in any of the corners. Let's listen to him talk about that. Uh, so how did you, how did you come to uh, your conclusion for yourself and then also to your stance as an agnostic? Thank you. Um, well, one of the things that I think is really out there is I, I developed a philosophy of what are the common elements before we get into the dispersion elements. And the common elements are eat a natural-based diet as fresh as you possibly can, maintain a caloric uh, deficit uh, at least most of the time so that when you go into these excesses that you do better, and then you choose a dietary practice that fits your lifestyle. In other words, something that you can maintain and sustain. So, so for some people, that's intermittent fasting. Some people that's eating six times a day, depending on their diet. You can also look at the genetic and epigenetic factors. What is the traditional diet that your ancestors have? Because it does determine your bacteria culture, how you digest and absorb that food. Uh, and then third things, what, what kind of diet can you can comply to? And then what other elements might have influenced that earlier on? Those would combine together on a real, if you were to do a deep dive on an individual level, which, you know, high performance people, bio-optimizer people and biohackers, that's what they do. (laughs) They get there. So there's no one size fits all. There are those components. I think they're important. Then when you get into the world of genetics and epigenetics, to understand that essentially the difference between the two is genetics are what are the predispositions that you've inherited in your body. Epigenetics is the turning off or the turning on of these genes in a way that is either either positive for the body or negative to the body, which leads to the study of nutrigenomics. Nutrigenomics is how do you flip these switches in your epigenetic response to the genetics you inherited. I believe this. At the end of the day, I believe that humans can survive and thrive on a very varied diet if they know how to throw the levers inside their system. Do I think I could do well on a ketogenic diet today, knowing what I know from digestive aids? Yes. Do I think that my business partner could do great on a plant-based diet who's on a ketogenic diet? Yes, I do. Because over the last 20 years, we've discovered how to pull those levers for ourselves. He prefers that diet. I prefer this diet. And we're here to advocate to everybody else it's not about the diet tribe that you belong is can you, does it work? Is it sustainable? And do you feel good about it? Right. You describe the, uh, you use numerous terms, but you're putting something into your mouth. doesn't necessarily mean you're going to digest and assimilate it. So it's the, um, it's the big picture rather than the, uh, the, the fancy choice out of the gate. And then your, your gut is all screwed up. So you're wasting that uh, delicious sushi that you just invested in thinking it was going to be a super healthy meal. I can't tell you. So, you know, for a period of time, I was on a completely raw food diet, which would be the equivalent of the carnivore diet from a plant-based side. Very, very extreme. And in that community, what I found was a lot of people who were sick who went to a raw food diet for a period of time and had a miraculous recovery. However, I also noticed something else. 
as they stayed on that diet for an extended period of time, they started to run into a variety of unintended consequences because whatever the restrictions that that diet created in the short term had a benefit to treat whatever condition they were suffering from. However, it was setting up the conditions for the next problem that they were having. The unintended consequences of the benefits of one source of eating had unintended consequences on the other part, part and parcel. I always had trouble digesting, absorbing, utilizing fats. I just did. For whatever reason, my body just didn't agree that I didn't feel good on it. I would avoid it. Maybe it was my bodybuilding psychology when we were on the old protein carbohydrate program. Where Matt was a big, he was a, he's been a keto guy for 20 years. I've been in, wow. yeah, over 20 years. And so we would have these debates back and forth about fats versus carbohydrates. He had a high sugar diet, didn't do well on carbs, feels better on the other. So later on, uh, a few years ago, he developed an enzyme formulation that actually worked with four different types of lipases, the enzyme that breaks down fats, that I could use and radically boost up my fat intake without getting fat in my stool. Because now I had the ability to break down, digest, and absorb that fat where I didn't have that ability before. And so now I could probably switch to a carnivore, ketogenic, high-fat diet and do very well because I have the technology that would allow me to do that and the ability to switch my bike or biome so I could do well on that diet. Wow, that's probably the case for so many people who steadfastly claim that they can't eat meat or animal products because their stomach goes nuts. And so they're, you know, lifelong confirmed on, on one path, which all they might need to do is unlock some more potential and enjoy a more varied diet, arguably a more healthy diet in many cases. So uh, that's pretty interesting. What other supplements are high up there? on the list of things that we're so deficient in. I'm looking on my shelf in the background. If you're watching on YouTube, I got my magnesium from the, uh, the bio-optimizer. So I hear that as a commonly deficient uh, agent that it's so important to supplement with. Uh, can you talk about a few other uh, big ones for you? Yeah, so the three, th th three areas where people run into digestive issues. Number one, they don't have enzymes present in the food, whatever you're eating, period. I don't care how great your diet is, you don't have sufficient amount of enzymes. And enzymes are all responsible for 25,000 different chemical uh, processes in the body. They are catalysts that transform things from one thing to another, uh, accelerate chemical reactions and are essential, in the, especially in the first stage of digestion. Second thing that people are low on is hydrochloric acid. By the way, here's a quick test to know if you're deficient on enzymes. If you eat your food and you feel that kind of bloated or feeling that full feeling, if you take um, uh, a tablespoon of lemon juice uh, with your food. And if that doesn't work, take two tablespoons of lemon juice. If you start to see a benefit from two tablespoons of lemon juice, chances are you're enzymatically deficient. Second phase, uh, critical stage of digestion is hydrochloric acid comes in and changes the pH and also is a disinfectant for parasites, bacteria, viruses, all that sort of stuff. Most people today have a deficiency in hydrochloric acid. Here's how you can test. You take uh, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, mix it in four to six ounces of water, drink it. If you don't burp within five minutes, guess what? You don't have enough hydrochloric acid. Now, one of the signs of low hydrochloric acid is oftentimes acid reflux and heartburn. It's not too much acid. It's too little. And that keeps- so What do you do? You take an antacid to make it worse, huh? Cor correct. I and and that's an issue because what's happening is the food is actually fermenting in your guts and keeping the the gas is releasing, creating the esophageal sphincter to stay open. And that as whatever acid you do have mixes up with the food that causes a burning sensation in the esophagus or the heart. And that's where we get acid reflux. Third area that we run into digestive distress is the microbiome, the balance between these good, bad, and ugly bacteria. So taking uh, and, and rotating or trying different types of probiotics to see which one works for you. Uh, we built P3OM, which is a uh, antiviral, antibacterial protolytic uh, formulation that's maintainable in the gut, has a patent. We have another one that's a, we have another one that is called the leaky gut formula. The leaky gut formula is probiotics that are very antibacterial and help rebuild the biofilm with, a, with an element called IG1 max. Or did I lose your volume? Okay. So uh, that one, and then we have a Cogni biotic product, which is a combination of bacteria that make neurotransmitters in combination with Chinese herbs, which 
help neurotransmitter formation because 95% of your neurotransmitters are in the gut and about 25% of the population don't have the ability to make their essential or more dominant neurotransmitter function. So you may do better on one of these or you might benefit from all of these. And then you mentioned magnesium, which I'll drop in really quickly. Magnesium is the most common deficient uh, mineral in virtually everybody's diet. The reason being, we went to monoculture farming 60 years ago. We threw, we developed the atomic bomb. The atomic bomb led to the disparity of all this nitrogen uh, bomb storage. They threw nitrogen on the soil. It increased the yield, cut the protein, cut the enzymes, cut the minerals, cut the vitamins by increasing yield to the growth rate of nitrogen. Then we had to add these herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, chemical agents on it. And we've got about 60 crops left in, in the world. We used to rotate. We used to plow hemp into the soil. We used to remineralize. We don't do this in monoculturing. That's why we're getting so much desert uh, going to from farmlands. It's a big, 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 big issue. But magnesium is responsible over 350 different pathways in the body. And in the increasing electrical transmission world, the EMFs, pollution, and blue lights, and the shifting of our bio the number one mineral that is being exhausted by our nervous system is, guess what? Magnesium. The use of stimulants, magnesium. The use of antidepressants, magnesium. The, uh, the, the regulation of blood sugar, the uh, vasomo- uh, vasomotor and vasodilation from migraine headaches, PMS syndromes, trace the magnesium. Muscle cramping, trace the magnesium deficiency. The stress response, getting angry or upset or being overstimulated, magnesium, sleep deficiency, almost all of the common elements we've come to route, a massive array of billions and billions of dollars of drugs can be traced back to an extensive long-term magnesium deficiency. And there's different magnesiums which are used for different parts of the body. And there was a fellow by the name of Dr. Um, um, uh, Poliquin, excuse me, Charles Poliquin, who mm-hmm. uh, trained 27 gold medalists, like 27 different sports gold medalists in the who's who of sports said, hey, in order for his athletes to, to do really well, he discovered that there were different types of magnesiums for different parts of the body. And so that was the precursor of why we started developing the full, the, the first seven type magnesium that deals with the, the magnesiums for the brain, the nervous system, the blood cells, the blood sugar regulation, everything that's all in there in one. Because I got tired of having six different bottles costing me a super amount of money to take all these different magnesiums that I wanted to get the benefit from that. And it's an extraordinary product and it's gone crazy. So uh, anyways, all that to t- tell you the kind of the, the backstory behind these things. Wade Lightheart, you're a high energy guy, man. I, I dig your I dig your action. Very compelling stories. I think we learned so much on this show. And I'm I'm curious, you know, your bodybuilding days are are long since past you. I'm wondering how you keep in shape today and what uh what's your favorite stuff to do? Yeah, great question. So uh, recently, of course, we didn't have, uh, we, I lost access to the dream gym, the Mecca of bodybuilding goals gym, which is closed down at the moment due to the lockdown. So what I've uh, developed is I have a mini trampoline that I jump on in my front yard. I have an X3 band set, which I discovered during this lockdown, which interesting enough has a different strength curve than regular weights. Yeah, and so the opposite it, and incredible. I just did a show with Dr. Jaquish and boy, I think this is one of the great breakthroughs coming in fitness because when you do a workout with that, you realize what working the maximum maximum power in, in those range of motions, the, the opposite of weights. And yeah, that's cool that you're into that too. Yeah, so I discovered that. I got a selectorized set of dumbbells and a little bench in my yard that I, that you know, those, those bow flex ones where you could do, you can turn, and you, so I got those going on. Uh, and then I've got an attack bike um, to do uh, high intensity training. So attack bike, that's the ones with the fins and you go kind of go like this or whatever. And I do that uh, three times a week for about eight minutes in, in 20 second sprints with 40 second rest, rest periods. And then I jump on the rebounder multiple times a day. I train with the bands three, four days a week and, and dumbbells in combination and then I do alternate day fasting. So I, mm. I, I eat for 12 hours and then I fast for 36, three times a week. And then wow. I take, uh, then I take, uh, Fridays and Saturdays completely off. I can do whatever I want, uh, as far as eating and go out with my friends and, you know, eat the things that you're not supposed to eat and make the social things to people like, how do you stay in shape? Way doing this? I'm like, well, I just don't eat three days a week. And they kind of laugh and they think, uh, is he serious? <laughs> and yes, I am. <laughs> That's a good plan. You're yeah. dialed in. I love it. Uh, how can we connect further with you? 
Yeah. So uh, for all your listeners out here today, if you uh, want to connect with us, you can always go to um, bioptimizers.com. In fact, if you go to bioptimizers.com, get over yourself. You can use a coupon code of get over yourself 10 and you'll get 10% discount on any of our products at Bioptimizers. I've also am giving away our 12 week double your energy course, which is a 12 week course, five to 15 minute videos of everything on all these different areas, the bucket theory of nutrition, how to choose your Jedi council, how to select things, how to figure it out. All that stuff is in there in these little quick, quick videos, give it away for free. So you can learn from all the people that I learned from. It's all condensed and we give that away to everybody. And all of our products have a 100% 365 day guarantee. If they try a product and they're not absolutely blown away, it's not the best one they've ever take. Call us up, text us, send a carry version, whatever you want to do. We'll give you all your money back. So Facebook, Bioptimizers, Awesome Health Podcast. We're all there at Bioptimizers main site. You can get there and, say, and uh, take advantage of it. All right. Great show. Thank you, Wade. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching on YouTube. Da, da, da. Thank you for listening to the show. We would love your feedback at getoveryourselfpodcast at gmail.com. And we would also love if you could leave a rating and a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. I know it's a hassle. You have to go to desktop iTunes, click on the tab that says ratings and reviews, and then click to rate the show anywhere from five to five stars. And it really helps spread the word so more people can find the show and get over themselves, because they need to. Thanks for doing it.